All right, Dr. Roberto Olivardia, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. So you co-authored a book about, it came out 20, almost 20 years ago. I know. It's been a while. It's called The Adonis Complex, How to Identify, Treat, and Prevent Body Obsession in Men and Boys. I remember seeing this book when it first came out. I thought it was interesting because it's all about body issues that men have, but that's something we typically associate with women. So let's talk about the Adonis complex. How do you how do you all define what it is sort of on a big picture view in the book? Sure. So when we, as researchers and as clinicians, I specialize in the treatment of working with boys and men with anorexia and bulimia and binge eating disorder, men who use anabolic steroids because they feel like they can't get big enough. And when we were thinking of a title of the book, we were sort of trying to think of something that encapsulated all of those manifestations. And Adonis is this mythological Greek character. He was half man, half God, and he represented the ideal in masculine beauty and strength and in appearance. And so we thought to call it Adonis complex to sort of represent all of the ways that men are striving in this pursuit of the ideal male body. And it is strange to think that was almost 20 years ago that that book came out. And I remember when it did come out, I mean, there were so many people that said, I do boys and men even struggle with this? I mean, is this even, how is this a rarity? And unfortunately it, it is not um, a rarity. And so our purpose really in getting that book out was to take what we were knowing from the research we were doing and clinically what we were seeing and letting people know this is, this is a big problem with males as well as with, with women and girls. So I remember in the 80s and 90s watching like PSAs about anorexia or like binge eating for, but it was always geared towards girls. Yes. When did you, so there was like an awareness that was happening with women and young women. When did you and your colleagues start noticing it with men? Was this like a, is this a fairly recent phenomenon? Fairly. So probably in the late 70s, early 80s, if you look in the scientific literature, that's when we started to see eating disorders in males studies start to pop up, but they were very limited samples and they were men who were primarily in treatment programs or were hospitalized. And I was, when I was a senior in college, I went to Tufts University and I'm from the Boston area. And I had known actually a couple of male students who independent of each other had disclosed to me that they were struggling with the eating disorders and were completely shameful about it. They said they had never told anybody about it. They were silently suffering. And I thought this would be something interesting to study. So I actually ended up doing a a thesis on it. And as part of it, I told uh, my thesis committee, I'm going to place ads in basically every college in the Massachusetts area, which we have many in Massachusetts, and just to recruit these men. And at that time, unbeknownst to me at that time, that was the first study that had recruited men from a community sample. So not men who were patients in hospitals or treatment centers, but sort of men who most of whom may never have sought treatment for it. And I remember my committee saying, well, you probably want a plan B because you may not get a lot of men respond to this ad. Well, I didn't need a plan B. I actually had many men. I remember my answering machine tape was full by the end of, you know, a couple of days of men saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're studying this. I thought I was the only one. And when we brought these men in and interviewed them, questionnaires, um, the overwhelming majority of them had never sought treatment for the eating disorder. And in fact, there were some men in that sample who were in treatment for depression, for substance abuse, and even in the context of that therapy, never disclosed to their therapist that they might have been binging or purging or compulsively exercising because of the stigma that they felt they had, that they would be seen as less masculine, it's weak, that people would question their sexuality because there was this stereotype that it was only something that affected women. So this, as I said, this book was published 20 years ago and you all provide numbers, but I imagine those numbers have changed since then. Like, do we have an idea of how many men are, you know, dealing with some sort of body issue, whether it's an eating disorder, like they're trying to lose a lot of weight or they're, you know, spending a lot of time in the gym trying to get bigger. Do we have any concrete numbers there? 
So generally, and part of it is that, you know, from the bottom up, I mean, there's still, it's ma- males in particular are still heavily under-researched. In fact, less than 1% of research on eating disorders is focused on male subjects. So there's, we still need a lot more work in, in, in even identifying these individuals. But generally speaking, the statistics say about anywhere from 10 to 15 million men in the U.S. are affected by eating disorders like anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder. About anywhere from 2 to 3 million men have something called body dysmorphic disorder, which is where you are preoccupied with a part of your body. It could be your nose, it could be your penis size, it could be your hair, your muscularity, to a point that really gets is significantly interfering in their lives and in which they obsess and often avoid situations because of their negative body image. And then when you include what we call subclinical body image and eating disorders, so people that might not meet the kind of clinical criteria, but are close to it, that amounts actually in the mil- anywhere from five to 10 million men. And in fact, a lot of men might fall right under that radar where even in research studies or in treatment samples might not be picked up because maybe they're not, because again, a lot of the criteria of how we even define some of these, particularly with eating disorders, was almost exclusively based on women. I mean, even the, the studies, I mean, if you look at some of the very popular eating disorder questionnaires and surveys, there'll be items like, I don't like my thighs, and you have to rate your level of agreement with that. You know, I don't like my butt. I don't like my breasts. You know, terms that are, you know, men don't really relate to the concept of thighs. Now, if you ask, if you were word that to say, I don't like my quads, you know, I don't, I'm not satisfied with my fitness shape or things like that, or my muscle size, then you're going to have a different endorsement of how men respond to that. So there's a, still a lot more work in identifying But I know just clinically with the majority of men that I treat who struggle with these things, I am one of few, if not the only person that knows that they struggle with it. It's still something that's very, very shameful. Now with the boys that I treat, obviously their parents and family members know, I have been seeing a trend where there's better identification now and people are coming into treatment earlier, which is a good thing. And at the same time, I've also seen an increase in these problems with boys and men. So let's talk about what's going on there. As you highlight in the book, like this really wasn't a problem, let's say, for my grandfather's generation, like that World War II generation. And it, you, but you started seeing it happening in the 70s and 80s. Like what changed? What's going on that's causing this uptick? Yeah, so that's absolutely true. So historically, we can document eating disorders in women to the 1600s. I mean, it's historically for spiritual, religious, media, pop culture, all of those reasons. With men, we really didn't see it so much in an, until, again, those late 70s, or early 80s. And we attribute a couple things to that. So one is that if we, and we've done studies looking at even advertising and media, Medium, that somebody had the brilliant idea of probably realizing, well, hey, we have half the population hating their bodies and profiting off of that. Why don't we make the other half of the population not like the way they look and profit off of that? And so we started to see, particularly in the early 80s, this rush of advertising featuring half nude, you know, male models, things like designer underwear, like think about it. I mean, in this would our grandfathers have cared about designer underwear like Calvin Klein or Armani, <laughs> you know, absolutely yeah. not. It, it would have been Fruit of the Loom or Hanes, you know, something just very functional. So the idea of men even thinking about those things started to become much more advertised uh, for them. Also, if you think about the early 80s, you know, in Hollywood, you have people like Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger and, you know, actors who were not sort of, who clearly rather their bodies were these issues of commodity and and currency for them, as opposed to the Hollywood actors in the 40s and the 50s. But also, we started to see a whole tide changing 
honest, in a very positive way around how women and men started to see themselves. And obviously in the late sixties and in the seventies, we had the women's liberation movement and, and feminist movement, which we talk about in the book as being a very positive cultural change. And in that change, it changed the way that women saw their gender roles and, and the, and the roles that they took. And at that, up until that point, men pretty much defined themselves in their mass masculinity by how strong they were, how much money they made. And when that is shared more with women, which again, I highlight is a positive thing, but I think one of the ways that now sort of came from that is that men had to sort of figure out what it meant to be a man if it wasn't being the breadwinner when maybe your spouse was making more money than you are or being the strongest person when there, you know, could be women in, in positions of, of strength and, and power. And the easiest, I guess the most concrete way to do that is through the body that, you know, men really, you started to see bodybuilding becoming much more the rage, like from Pumping Iron and that documentary. Also, anabolic steroid use became much more accessible to the average man. It wasn't just relegated to elite bodybuilding circles that use you know, in the fifties that you would see. So all of that together, I think kind of create this way of like how to build a body that is representative of, of being masculine, you know, and, and a lot of the men that I work with who struggle with eating disorders that that issue of masculinity often comes up. So that's an interesting point because I've read similar studies in anthropology research about when countries that have high levels of gender egalitarianism, you actually see this weird thing where the genders start accentuating their differences even more. Correct. Because they, 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 they want to find a way like, hey, we're same this way, but how are we different? And so in this case, men, it's like they can put on a lot of muscle, they can get the big shoulders, something women you know, they can, but not as well as men because they've, men have androgen receptors in those muscles right. that increase more testosterone. But yeah, I mean, in some countries, women, like they act more feminine, even though they can do everything else that a man can do. They're just trying to differentiate themselves. Right. It's, it's interesting because one of the, the anthropological studies we came, we came across was research of this tribe in Africa called the Wodabi tribe. And this is a tribe where women have a lot of, a great degree of sexual liberation. If they decide that their husband is unattractive, they could have an extramarital affair. And that is sanctioned sort of in the tribe and that culture. So men, what we also see is that men in this tribe are very, very astute to their body image. I mean, they they adorn themselves with certain kind of colors and feathers and costumes, and it all actually culminates in this ceremony called the Jerawal ceremony, which is basically a male beauty pageant where you know men will show off their teeth and their height and their their bodies and adorn themselves again with with clothing, and women will judge them and they. They'll mock and humiliate the men that are not up to par and the men who are sort of seen as more attractive are applauded and, you know, might be, you know, getting, getting some sex that night. So it, it's interesting that in this culture now, it doesn't mean that it's a completely egalitarian culture, but at least sexually it is that there's a great degree of sexual liberation. And, and that certainly came about, you know, in the seventies and eighties where with the invention of the birth control pill and, and again, shifting gender roles and women being seen as individuals who are could have sexual satisfaction and and are entitled to that that it, it did shift this way and even now i mean it's so interesting which is how gender is talked about and in, in gender fluidity and everything what we're going to see and how that sort of impacts you know the way that body image gets looked at even today. It is interesting. I think that I was talking to my wife about that, that the studies you guys talked about, about how egalitarianism led to differentiation. I was like, we were like, that explains, like when you go to the toy store now, there's like a pink aisle and then there's like the blue aisle. Mm -hmm. Like, I know growing up in the eighties, there wasn't that. There was like Legos and there was, that was it. Like there weren't pink Legos. It was just, you had Legos. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, it's just sort of weird that that that's happened. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So there's a combination of things going here. Egalitarianism, 
So men are trying to find a way to differentiate themselves. So they're putting on muscle. There's the change in advertising that's been going on. That's, you know, been you know laid, you know, we, we've we attributed the problem with female body image disorders with the sort of the Photoshop fakeness of beauty advertising. And you talk about movie stars. Yeah, movie stars now, like they're all jacked. Like Hugh Jackman mm-hmm. is literally jacked. But if you go back to the 50s, like, you know, John Wayne, Robert Mitchum, yes. uh, Paul Newman, Rob, like they just looked like regular dudes. Like they didn't, they weren't like super, they weren't super huge or super jacked. Absolutely. I mean, even like with with cigarette ads featuring the Marlboro man, you know, who is this sort of rough and tumble kind of masculine dude that, yeah, he wasn't, he didn't have a six pack. And that was, that's all it took. You had to have a certain level of this kind of air and confidence about you. I mean, all of those actors of yesteryear certainly had a certain confidence and a certain way about them, but it was not connected to their bodies. It wasn't sort of connected. I mean, they were seen as attractive men or handsome men by by people. But a lot of times, even the way we think of what we find attractive is often linked to what we find in other attributes. If somebody is confident, we tend to find more confident people attractive. And so it was a very stark change compared to, you know, you're right, what we see now. I mean, with Hugh Jackman, with, I remember when Fight Club, when that movie came out and so many of my patients, that was like one of those movies that all of them responded to this idea that it, that was a shift actually too, where it became less about being just big and muscular, like sort of like the kind of pumping iron, but more about looking ripped and looking lean. And I remember that movie getting a lot of attention around that, this idea that, you know, Brad Pitt had this just cut body. And that was the beginning I felt of that shift and that trend to not always being sort of this big muscle and fitness guy in the room, but still being very fit and being very defined. Yeah, I remember that. That's that scene where that first scene he has a shirt off and he's like, you know, he's carved from wood, I guess it was like yes. the, the scene. Yeah, and my, what, but yeah, people saw there like, I want that. But what they forget is that, you know, Brad Pitt was probably hadn't eaten anything in like a day. It was probably right. hyper dehydrated, right? To get all the fluid out. So he looked like that. Uh, without a doubt. I mean, some of the, in, the in Adonis complex and some of which most of which got in the book, but some of the stuff that didn't get in the book was, you know, interviews or people that I had met who talk about, I remember this one woman I met with who was an underwear model stylist and and photographer. So her job was to photograph men in famous underwear ads. And she said that basically they have men wear underwear that is two to three sizes too small for them and perhaps multiple of those underwear. They'll often enhance their bulge with everything from Wonder Bread to, you know, sort of sexual toys, anything, because she says that's what you're, if you can convince a guy that he's going to have a bigger penis wearing an underwear, then he's going to buy it. Or the women in their lives or the other men in their lives, in the case of gay men, will buy it for them. And so she said, there's so much that she says gets manipulated. I mean, you can manipulate abs. I talked to a makeup artist who said that she could draw abs in for men that just don't have a six pack, but she could draw them in in a way that could look I mean, you wouldn't even know the difference. And so there is so much of that manipulation that we know happens. But I think, again, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, attention and I, and I never, it's not about taking the attention away from women, but also understanding to put men in the dialogue as well and understanding, you know, because there are lots of boys and men who are, who are suffering and I'm seeing it younger also. I mean, I've worked with boys as young as nine who struggle with significant body image and eating disorders. And I imagine social media has only amplified this even oh, more. Without a doubt, without a doubt. That now that's something that, you know, I've always thought if, if, I ever, if we ever do the sort of revised or updated edition of Adonis Complex, it would ha- we'd have to have a whole chapter just on social media because I, I have a teenage son who's 14. I have a daughter who's 12. And there's no question. He actually showed me an app. I was giving a presentation. He said, oh, dad, you should talk about, I think it was called Facetune. And he said, is this app where people take a picture and By a couple clicks, you can remove all your acne off the, you can whiten your teeth. You could, and when you go on, when I, when I think it was on the website, there were just as many 
before and afters of males as there were to females. I mean, they, they market to both teenage boys and to teenage girls to basically enhance their appearance. And I think it's so destructive because so, okay, you have this picture now of what your ideal what you have now seen as your ideal self. And now you put that where? You put that on Facebook, on Instagram, but you don't really look like that. So what is that going to do? It's just a setup to just feel even worse about yourself uh, or not. I work with adult men who are in the dating scene and will put a picture in their dating profile that is is kind of is photoshopped, is enhanced, is using that kind of app. And then they're, they're, frighteningly anxious about meeting the person on the first date because they don't 100% look that way. And it's just, it's it's so, I find it very destructive. I mean, which is why right now my kids don't have any social media and I'm going to try to have it be that way until they're in college. Right. <laughs> I mean, honestly, no, I yeah. think there are a lot of issues with it. I mean, I think it could be very helpful, but in terms of, for in other areas and venues, but for body image, I've seen it be nothing but a, a very negative influence. And you know, also on social media, particularly on Instagram, a lot of the influencers there, like they make their money peddling products that improve your yes. appearance, right? So weight loss teas, supplements, teeth whitening, whatever. That's how a lot of those guys make their money. Oh, without a doubt. And, and for people to understand, I mean, how kind of manipulative and how they're, they're, and it sounds, this sounds very, you know, conspiracy, but it's true because I had an experience with, it was a very popular men's magazine. I won't name the magazine, but it was very popular men's magazine. They did an article when Adonis Complex came out. And one of the things I talked about in the article were all these supplements that are out there. And I said, some of them are useless. Some of them are actually harmful for you. And maybe there are some that might have proven could increase muscle mass by like a very, very small percentage. And I basically went on to kind of slam them and got a call from the editor of the magazine said, well, you know, we really want to run this and we want this to be the cover story, but a lot of our advertisers are those supplements that you kind of trash. And so could you say, would you be willing to say something different about it? And I said, no, um, <laughs> I feel how I feel about it. And then basically the, the whole conversation changed where maybe they wouldn't run the, the article. And I said, well, then don't run the article. Like I'm not, I'm not going to say something different. So they ended up running it. It became, it wasn't as prominently featured it was, as it was originally intended to, but they deleted everything that I said about supplements. And I thought, wow, isn't this interesting that they're, here's information that I'm sharing with the public and they have a right, you know, to edit and I, it's their magazine. However, it is, it is motivated from, from profit. You know, it's motivated because these companies basically said like, we don't like this and we are trying to sell this product. And, you know, so the public is not getting sometimes the right information. So another way that sort of body image has changed for men, you guys showed this too, you guys do a great job. You guys became amateur toy collectors in the process of writing this book. <laughs> yes. And you show like, you know, show like uh, like a GI Joe from the 1960s to a GI Joe from like the late 90s. And like 60s GI Joe, I mean, just looked like a regular guy. But 90s GI Joe, like he's got biceps that are like the size, like half the size of his waist. <laughs> right. And so that's changed as well. Yes. Oh my gosh, without a doubt. I mean, that was actually a very fun paper that we wrote. And it, we were actually surprised by how you know, big of a disparity the measurements would be. And that that's inspired by the very famous Barbie doll study that was done in 1980, which showed that if Barbie were a real-life human female, that her dimensions would be completely unrealistic. Like, you just couldn't create that body. And, and you may have heard that for years, Mattel was getting a lot of pressure from moms groups and from feminist groups and body image advocacy groups, and they refused to change. And then eventually, Actually, they did start to change Barbie's proportions. And so technically she is, it's doable to have that body if you were, you know, severely underweight with breast implants, pretty much. And so we thought, what would be the analogy to that? And I thought, well, I used to play with action figures when I was a kid. And so I went to a toy store and with the permission of parents, I, I said, can I ask your kid like what kind of action figures they would like? And these boys, and they pulled them out and I bought them all and we measured them and 
that's exactly what we found that if these, these like Batman today, the action figure was not Adam West, you know, from the TV show. But what was striking, the most striking about that were the Star Wars action figures, because unlike G.I. Joe, which you could argue that the G.I. Joe in the 1960 is a different character than the G.I. Joe in 1990. And yes, even though the G.I. Joes now are much more muscular and ripped and, and just leaner. But with Star Wars, it was so Star Wars came out in the 70s, as you know, and then in the mid to late 90s, when we were doing this study, it was re released in the theaters because it was digitally remastered. So they re released the action figure line. So now these are based on the same character. Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker is the same character from the 1970s movies, 1990s. And those action figures, if you see, you know, anyone can Google it. They're probably, it's probably online is so strikingly different. It's almost laughable that, I mean, it, even Mark Hamill, the actor was quoted as saying, Oh my God, they put me on steroids when he saw the new action figure. It's just, it's doesn't even look like him. His waist size is dramatically smaller. His pectoral muscles are defined with his, his robe open more to show more chest. Han Solo looks like he's been at the gym significantly over the 20 years. I mean, it's just, and that was shocking to us because we're like, why are you changing that? Like, you're not even, it. it's not like they made it look more realistic. It actually looks more uh, further away from what those characters look like in the film. And so this has all led to a change in how a lot of American or Western men picture the ideal male body. You've done, you talk about these interesting research studies you did with different types of people, different ages, where you ask them to pick their ideal body. And you asked this to men who were younger, women who were younger, and older men. And I thought it was interesting is, you know, a lot of times men focus working on their bodies. They think, well, what a woman wants is a super muscular, shredded guy. But when you asked women the like their ideal body, it wasn't that. Right. So that that was a great study. That was um, my dissertation, actually, from when getting my PhD, where so we developed this computer program called the Somatomorphic Matrix. And when you go on the computer, you're presented with an image that is corresponds to a certain percent of body fat and a certain percent of muscularity. So unlike women with body image, generally, that most women being over overweight and being over fat are the same thing. So women, you know, they step on a scale. If they see a number that's too high, they don't like that, you know, if they feel that they're overweight. With men, what made those studies often invalid is that a lot of those earlier studies when they would do for men, because with women, they would present them with different images, not on a computer, but on a piece of paper. And they would say, what's your ideal? How do you perceive yourself? And what these for heterosexual women, how do you think that what are men's ideal of, of the women's body? And invariably, what you find is women prefer an image that is very underweight, often like restrictive. They see themselves as fatter than they actually are. And they think that men want them to be thinner than men actually want them to be. So when those studies were done with men, they kind of said, well, men aren't really dis aren't dissatisfied because some men want to lose weight, some want to gain weight, and so it cancels each other out. Well, what they weren't accounting for was muscle mass and muscularity because most of the men that I work with, they don't mind if they're 250 pounds, let's say, when they're, you know, quote unquote, supposed to be 200, as long as they're all muscle. So being overweight really is less integral to their body image is, is seeing themselves as being over fat. So when we did that study, and these were college men who were, uh, had to pick what is their ideal body? How do they see themselves? And these were heterosexual men. How do you think a woman your age wants how, what she prefers? And we found that men preferred a body image that was about eight pounds less body fat, which was actually not that significant. However, that had 25 pounds more muscle, which was statistically significant. And then when we actually polled women and had women take the study, the survey, we found that women preferred a less muscular body than what men thought women preferred. And what was actually the, the very interesting to me was I had hypothesized that men's ideal body would be, would match what he thought the, that women would prefer. And in fact, that wasn't true. That in fact, men preferred a body that was even bigger than what they thought the average woman even preferred. 
But the, the factor that really shone through was how big they thought the average guy was. So there was something very important about men being bigger than other men, even if that was to the exclusion of what women actually preferred. Now, one could argue maybe if you're the biggest guy in the room, you have your choice of any partner in the room or you have the best options. But the fact that that variable didn't even pan out where it it really didn't even matter what women preferred, it just mattered how big they were as compared to other men. Yeah, I wonder when I read that, I wonder if it's like, are men really doing it for like women or are they just trying to compete with other men? Right. It's like, you know, there's that, you know, saying like my, I think I've heard like women don't dress for men. They dress for other women. Mm-hmm. Right. I, and when there's like, there's an in, intra sexual competition going on between men. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I think there's definitely something, the idea of, you know, men in a locker room, you know, kind of comparing penis size and men in the gym, you know, looking at their their muscles and who's bench pressing. And we see it with women, as you mentioned as well. I mean, there have been studies that have had that have asked men how attractive they find women wearing makeup is. And actually a lot of men you know, prefer less makeup, you know, than more for women. So that there are, there's definitely this intrasexual competition going on. Now, whether that's for this ultimate goal of, again, having the most options to, you know, who you mate with and, and whatnot, um, that, you know, remains to be, you know, seen. But without a doubt, I mean, a lot of the, the men that I work with, particularly the ones who are obsessed with their muscle size and muscularity, they're more concerned about how weak they feel they look in comparison to other men. And they're constantly comparing themselves to, is that guy bigger than me? Is he more muscular than me? And part of it is that what makes body image problems so you know, so difficult for people is that if it doesn't really have to do with the body. It's more around what we feel we get by having an ideal body. So it's, if I have this ideal body, then I'm going to be more confident. I'm going to be more powerful. I'm going to be seen as more attractive. It's, it's all of that that we have to sort of break down and unpack in, in working with these boys and men. Well, one more thing with the, the study you did, not only did you pull college age men and women, but you also pulled like older men and women, Mm -hmm. like I think in their fifties or sixties. And what I thought was interesting there, there was no difference between men and women on what they thought the ideal male body was. Right. Yeah. That there is something, I mean, with, with body image, we do see changes kind of, you know, developmentally. Um, although I have, I work with men in their forties and fifties who either struggle with eating disorders or who have body dysmorphic disorder. They, you know, they don't want to have wrinkles and they don't want their hair to go gray or they don't want to lose their hair. Um, and I've been seeing more of that, but typically in, in previous body image research, you, people tend to get more satisfied with their body image as they age, which is interesting because we associate being older with kind of, you know, being not liking sort of our bodies. But actually, I don't, I think part of that is, you know, when you get older, you value health a lot more, you become much more aware of your mortality. And so, you know, you kind of realize that there's almost something very trivial about worrying about how other people see you when you have sort of a more fully lived experience. Um, and, but it's very normative for us to worry about that when we're younger. And again, it's not just around, oh, I want people to like my skin and my hair and my body, but I want to be accepted. I want to have connections. I want to have relationships. And unfortunately, there's a cultural script around, well, a way to get that is by looking good, or the only way to get that is by looking a certain way. Well, so let's uh, delve in deeper to some of these different ways the Adonis complex manifests itself. So you mentioned muscle dysmorphia or body dysmorphia. And yes. one of that ways, you guys call this bigorexia, which you introduced a whole new word to the lexicon. <laughs> so this idea that, you know, so it's the opposite of anorexia where people, someone thinks they're they're fatter than they really are. Bigorexia is someone is not as muscular as they think they really are. Right. That they, their fear is that they're not as muscular as, in fact, that they can be. I mean, some of the men I work with muscle. So we, you're right. So it was first, we called it bigorexia. And then we kind of changed it to a more clinical name of muscle dysmorphia. Um, and some of these men I work with are very muscular guys. I mean, they're objectively 
big guys, muscular guys, but they don't see it. Just like the 80 pound woman with anorexia who really thinks she's fat. So these are not the guys that you would see at Venice Beach with their shirts off, kind of pumping. They, even though they might have those bodies, they come to my office on a 90 degree day and they have long sleeve shirts on because they fear that someone might see their quote unquote scrawny legs, scrawny arms. They might be wearing pants because they don't want people to see their scrawny, puny legs. Um, they work out incessantly. A lot of them do steroids. So it, it is, very much like everything you see with anorexia, but just kind of almost as if the pendulum is just swinging in the other direction. And in fact, studies that I've done that have compared men with anorexia with men with muscle dysmorphia find that they actually look more similar than different in a lot of profiles because it's we kind of see it as just the same thing. It's just different variants of the same thing. And I mean, so you mentioned like the extreme cases where people are wearing baggy clothes, but you also highlight in this book, you know, people that you saw, men, you saw that, you know, their muscle dysmorphia got in the way of their career. Like they, they got fired from their mm-hmm. job because they're spending too much time at the gym, got in the way of healthy relationships because uh, they're, you know, instead of spending time with their significant other, they were spending time at the gym or they're just bugging their significant others. Like, am I big enough? Am I big enough? Am I big enough? And like, you know, for some people like that, that insecurity is unattractive. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it really is is I you know when we started talking about this and doing research I mean unfortunately it didn't garner any sympathy from people because people were like oh you know bodybuilders like oh they're so vain and they're so arrogant and and all that but this is not that like this is not vanity any more than an eating disorder is about vanity you know we shouldn't look at someone with anorexia and think oh they're just doing that for attention it's all about vanity. it's a it's a serious serious issue and with the the men that I work with they really feel like they're almost their survival sort of depends upon their the way their body is. And so they will do anything. I mean, I've had, you know, calls from, I remember a call from a dad I got years ago whose son, he was 18, struggled with, with this. And he said, it started with his son asking, dad, do I look as muscular today as I did yesterday? Is that guy across the street, does he look bigger than I do? Do, do you, do, does my bicep look as big as it did, you know, yesterday? And he said it started out maybe be three to four times a day. And it got to a point where he literally counted. It was um, I was up to 80 to 90 times a day his son was asking for reassurance. And in he said it was almost like delusional. Um, and there's it's this incredible anxiety around it. And and instead of, you know, going, you know, to functions that they're supposed to be going to school or work, they were at the gym working out. Um, they felt compelled to do it. Um, these are men who are boys and men who, if there was, you know, I live in the Boston area, we get blizzards sometimes in the winter and gyms will close that they will have serious panic attacks. Some of them will feel suicidal if they feel like they're losing muscle mass. I mean, it seems very strange probably to a lot of people to, to hear, but, you know, if we think about it, if we flip it to eating disorders, you know, 15 to 20% of men and women with eating disorders will die. And of that 15 to 20%, half are due to suicide and the other half are due to the medical complications of the eating disorder. But there is a high suicide rate in this population. And body dysmorphic disorder or BDD, of which muscle dysmorphia is is a subtype of body dysmorphic disorder, it has outside of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and depression has one of the highest suicide rates. So these are individuals, this is not, again, somebody who is just kind of vain. Um, it's It's much more serious than that. And, I mean, as you talk about in the book, it's, you know, it's actually, there's a, there's an, a, an element of obsessive compulsive disorder going on there. Like someone who would, you know, you know, compulsively wash their hands are probably more likely to obsessively work out of the gym if, you know, they caught that bug for whatever reason. Yes. Yeah, so we, we think of in, in psychiatric disorders, we sort of can group them almost in different families, so to speak. And one of the families that share a genetic and underlying genetic predisposition is what we call the obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders. That includes OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, body dysmorphic disorders in that there could be generalized anxiety disorder, trichotillomania, which is compulsive hair pulling, you know, certain variants of panic disorder that all kind of have this genetic. So we'll, in doing family history studies, uh, oh, anorexia was 
certainly be in there that you might find kind of runs in families as well that a lot of the people that I've treated for muscle dysmorphia you'll often see a family member that might not have muscle dysmorphia but will likely have OCD a history of anorexia you know something of that it just doesn't you'll often see it run run in families so what's the treatment for muscle dysmorphia like like for extreme cases Yes. Yeah, so typically the, the men that I see with muscle dysmorphia, they come into my office. They never say, I want to come in and stop working out. They often come in because their lives have hit a real bottom. They've gotten fired from their third job because they are late constantly because they're at the gym. They are getting it. Their wife is divorcing them because they are, you know, chronically obsessed, you know, with, with this and they won't leave the house, let's say, to, for social functions because they feel that they don't look good enough. So in that treatment is a combination of what we would call cognitive behavioral therapy, which would include really looking at their cognitions or their thoughts. Things like if I lose muscle mass, then nobody will like me. If I go out in public and people see me as weak and and you try to examine with them the evidence for that you know how how accurate are these thoughts and most of them are not there's a very almost this level of delusionality that you'll see in individuals with with body dysmorphic disorder um where you know, they'll say, oh, that person is looking at me clearly because they think I look ugly or they think I look too skinny. And it's like, no, they're looking at you because you just walked in the room or they could be looking at you because you look like their brother or because you have this cool shirt on. There are many other reasons someone could be looking at you or they might think you're attractive. So you try to really work at deconstructing those thoughts. And then the behavioral part is anything that they're avoiding you expose them to something called exposure plus response prevention therapy, which is the hallmark of treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder. So if somebody, for example, has contamination fears and they're avoiding touching doorknobs and shaking people's hands, the the best and really only way that you can treat that is having the person touch doorknobs and not only touch doorknobs and other people's hands, but touching dirty toilet seats and not washing their hands for an hour or two and basically have them get used to the anxiety. We call it the process of habituation, that they're habituating to the anxiety and recognizing that the anxiety will come and go. What goes up must come down. And when it goes, you realize that that that, that feeling that you have that compels you to do the compulsion or to avoid a situation that if we just stick through the emotion, kind of get through it, that we realize that nothing bad is actually happening, that it's just, it's our mind kind of thinking that way. And then with muscle dysmorphia, I'll work on things. A lot of the men that I've treated with muscle dysmorphia also tend to have social anxiety, other sort of conditions and disorders that I think feed into it. So we might do some assertiveness skills and social skills. Some of them have histories of trauma of sexual or physical abuse, which makes sense. You know, building a a big body becomes a way of defending yourself and not looking weak. If in the case I've worked with gay men who have muscle dysmorphia, who have used their bodies as a way to kind of fight against a sort of homophobic stance that gay men are inherently less masculine than heterosexual men, which, you know, isn't necessarily true. And that they're, you know, gay men and straight men that, you know, whose gender identity is very different than their sexual orientation. But I've worked with a number of gay men who really got into building their bodies as a way of no one kind of questioning their masculinity because unfortunately gay men have to defend their masculinity because of their sexual orientation. So there are a lot of different causes that can feed into it. And so we try to address those roots. But but most importantly, honestly, is just getting them to do these behaviors. Um, not, you know, if they're weighing themselves 20 times a day, we we remove the scale. And how do you tolerate not knowing what your weight is? And and still going out that day and not wearing the long sleeve shirts when it's 90 degree weather. And I'll do these kind of exposures where I'll walk outside my office with the patient and they have to wear short sleeves and shorts and we walk in a crowded place and it can be, um, and, and it works. I mean, if, if someone can tolerate that. So, okay. One part of the Adonis complex is bigorexia, muscle dysmorphia. Another part you mentioned is men with eating disorders and it's something we typically associate with women. Yes. Thanks to those PS 
essays in the 80s and 90s. But here's a question. So how, is there a difference between the way men and women manifest or experience eating disorders? Like they do it differently? That does that question make sense? Sure, absolutely. So um, for the most part, it can, it can, look very similar. I would say that the main difference is if you take with anorexia, that the overwhelming, I mean, I, I certainly any woman I've ever treated with anorexia, it's, it's their goal is to look skinny and to look very thin. And it's as that's that's kind of their straightforward goal with the majority of boys and men that I've treated for anorexia that they don't identify with the word skinny they don't want to be skinny they want to be lean and they'll still say to you um, and they say to me all the time I know that I look really thin. So in, in some ways, they actually have a clearer perception of what their body looks like. However, I am so fearful of being fat and gaining weight that I just, I'm kind of stuck in this. But I, I, if, I, if you told me that every bite of food that I ate would immediately convert into muscle in my body, then I wouldn't have a problem eating. And of course, and what I tell these these boys is, well, in order to create muscle, you need to have fat. Like your body isn't going to just create muscle without having fat. And so there is that bridge where you have to eat and you're going to need to have a certain amount of body fat and your body has to trust that you're going to hold on to a certain amount of body fat because if you have no body fat, you will die. Your, your body won't be able to survive. And so a lot of the males I treat, and what's interesting is that this actually almost becomes a helpful factor in the treatment because they're not totally wedded in this, in the, this ideal of being skinny. And so, but for them, it's the, the fear of that bridge. Now, a lot of times these men can lapse into muscle dysmorphia. So when they start to gain weight, and they're so fearful of gaining fat that they lapse into this muscle dysmorphia paradigm. And so we tried to prevent that. So that's a, a big difference. Um, with bulimia nervosa, which is uh, binge eating uh, coupled with compensating behaviors like self-induced vomiting or laxative use, compulsive exercise. Generally speaking, we don't see as much laxative use with men as we would see with women. I would say I see just as much self-induced vomiting, but certainly the over-exercise is probably more common as a purging method, whereas with women, you'll see the self-induced vomiting or fasting. So women that who might binge eat and then don't eat for two days and then binge eat, you know, the sort of almost like a coupling of anorexia and bulimia. And then with binge eating disorder, which basically just got recognized over the last you know, since the mid to late 90s, that unlike anorexia and bulimia, which certainly affect more women than men, a binge eating disorder is almost at about a 50-50 gender distribution. Now, having said that, what's very important for people to know is that about 25% of people who struggle with eating disorders are male. And that is, you know, something that years ago, it would have been, you know, maybe less than 1%, you know, of, of individuals uh, with eating disorders are male. And studies have shown that if you look in treatment centers about, you know, perhaps one in 16 to one in 20 eating disorder patients are male, but in the community, it's about one in four people with an eating disorder are male, which means there are a lot of men out there who never come through treatment doors. Now, part of that is a lot of treatment centers don't accept men. A lot of eating disorder programs are just exclusively for women. And, and then again, some of that comes from just men themselves not having a hard time seeking treatment. Something you also talk about in the book when it comes to eating disorders in men, for a lot of these men, it, it starts off in high school if they were like a wrestler. And they, they, you know, cause it requires that cutting weight and they do these extreme measures to get as much body weight off of them as possible. And then after wrestling's over, they're still, it's still, it's still with them. Yes. That was um, the very first study I did actually on eating disorders in men. I got calls actually from a lot of wrestlers who, and I, I didn't have a wrestling team in my high school. I didn't know any wrestlers in, when I was younger who said, oh, I could, you know, gain and lose 20 pounds in two to three days. And I thought, how is that even possible for someone to do that? But then I got many calls from various 
wrestlers from various colleges saying, you know, talking about these practices. And the men that I included in the study were men who engage in these behaviors even after wrestling season. But it opened my eyes to sort of this practice of, you know, cutting your weight down and then binging and putting the weight back on. And interestingly, there are sports, ballet dancing or wrestling or football, where weight is very sort of is an integral variable. However, what I found in general and in patients that I work with is, yes, engaging in these sports can sometimes trigger and create eating disorders in individuals, particularly if you don't have healthy modeling from coaches or, or, you know, peers. However, a lot of the patients that I work with who had eating disorders sometimes will gravitate to sports that emphasize keeping and maintaining a certain body weight, almost like it's kind of, kind of fueling something that was already there to begin with, but then it absolutely exponentially makes it worse. And that that's a tough population in general too, because you know, I've worked with college students who are highly, highly competitive athletes whose college college scholarships are because of their sport, who some of them are, you know, could be Olympic athletes. And to them, you know, they see their eating disorder as something that's almost integral to their success. And the the fear of being, of not engaging in these behaviors mean, well, maybe I'm not going to be as good of an athlete, then I'll lose my scholarship and I'm going to disappoint everyone and I won't make it, I won't make these goals. And it's, um, it's a much harder sort of navigation to that, but it still comes down to, and what it ultimately comes down to in, in recovery for these people is you, they've had to choose, you know, living or, you know, doing well in, in these sports because I've worked with men who are 20, 21 who have had heart attacks because of their bulimia. It's very, very dangerous. Our, we are not meant to treat our bodies this way. And your body will do very, very strange things when you're you know, making yourself vomit all the time when you're not eating when you should be. It can really mess up the way your heart regulates itself and, and your, you know, other parts of your body functions, your organ functions work. And I've seen it happen and it's, it's, it's disturbing. And so that's what I think people have to recognize. This is a public health issue. Yeah. And the sad irony is you said not only can it these, cause these extreme health complications, but it also just, even if that doesn't happen to you, it's probably hindering the athlete's performance, right? Because that, that extreme weight loss can you know, wreak havoc on your hormones. For oh, example. without, absolutely. And then, right. And then when you bring in hormones into all of this, I mean, that is, you know, the interesting thing with particularly the men with muscle dysmorphia who use anabolic steroids, of which about so I would say about 50% of the men that I've worked with who have muscle dysmorphia will use steroids. And it makes sense. I mean, steroids are quick and easy way to gain muscle, except that it has so many adverse medical effects to it. But one of which is that when you inject or bring in testosterone into your body, your body stops producing its own natural testosterone because it basically says, oh, we're getting it from somewhere else. We don't need to make it anymore. And so it can actually create these sort of feminizing effects of gynecomastia, which is like breast enlargement, testicular shrinkage, impotence, all of these things that of course go against what any man, you know, would want and can actually create like a dependence on steroids. So it's not a dependence in the same way that we would talk about with cocaine, for example, but it is, it's a physiological dependence in that when men who do steroids for a period of time and they stop doing them and their bodies are not just going to kick right back into producing testosterone, their bodies will kind of lose that muscle mass and sometimes create these sort of feminizing effects because now they're not getting any sort of free, you know, this free range of testosterone in their body. So it, and then what that does to them mentally, you know, the concept of roid rage, of being incredibly aggressive, low frustration tolerance. I've absolutely seen that happen. That is a real thing. Some people would say it's a myth. It is not a myth. It's been scientifically proven. 
I mean, it wreaks havoc on all of those things. And especially if you're a teenager who's struggling with these things, these are, you know, particularly the boys I work with, it is a critical, critical window. And like some of the habits that they're doing and the ways that they might be, you know, being very destructive in their bodies could literally affect them the rest of their life. So that's why it's so important to get treatment you know, as quickly as possible and specifically during those developmental windows. But quickly to go back to the athletes that when I have worked with athletes who have recovered, all of them will say, oh my gosh, it is so much better. And I'm so much a better athlete being healthy. You know, it's similar to, you know, a lot of musicians who, when I have worked with who are sober from drug addiction, you know, who have attributed their creativity to drug use, realize, no, I'm still a creative person. I can still write good songs and I can still be artistic and just actually be more mentally stable and mentally sane. And so I think a point we should make, which we haven't, but I think, you know, it's been implicit, like you're not talking about not caring about how you look at all. Like that's not the solution. Like you should, you know, of course, correct. Be fit, exercise, basic grooming. You want to put out that that's 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 all good. It's like when it becomes all consuming and it becomes like it just it ruins other aspects of your life. That's when it's a problem. Correct. And and I'm glad you brought that up because that is something that I get, you know, we get accused of a lot is, is saying that we are promoting the Pillsbury Doughboy or I've heard it so much. I mean, I've done radio shows where callers call in and, you know, they think, oh, you, you know, just want everyone to be obese and not care about the way they look. No, that's not at all. I, you know, first and foremost, I want people to be healthy. I want people to be physically healthy, psychologically healthy. And at the same time, I want you to have a healthy body image. And part of body image is I, to look, to feel good about the way you look. Like I, you know, wear certain clothes that I feel, you know, fit me well and that I feel good about and kind of express who I am. I, you know, style my hair in a certain way and, you know, do I go to the gym and I run. And so it's not that I do that for health reasons, but I also do it for body image reasons. But it, like you said, it doesn't dominate me, you know, it, and that's where I usually water it down to, you know, the, the line when people ask me like, what's that line that, that gets crossed over? And to me, it's, you know, are you doing something that's destructive or that's unhealthy? So if you're engaging in purging behavior and restrictive eating and anabolic steroid use and substance abuse that's meant to, to lose weight, that's not healthy. If your self-esteem is primarily rested upon the way you look, you're headed for disaster because there's one thing I can guarantee you is you will look different five years from now than you do, you know, from now. Um, our bodies are changing. We age. So, you know, can some, can you feel good about the way you look? And that represents some of your self-esteem? Sure. But if the majority of your self-esteem is built on that or built on, honestly, you know, anything that has any sort of comparative effect. Like if you're primarily your self-esteem is based on, let's say, your academic performance, that can be very tricky too, because there are people that are, could be getting better grades than you do and people who are higher ranked, you know, than you are. But if you base your self-esteem on your your intellect, well, that's something that's going to carry with you the rest of your life. And it doesn't depend upon other people. It doesn't depend upon the approval of other people. If your self-esteem is on your sense of humor, is on the way you treat people, those are consistent factors. But when it's something on body image, it's dangerous territory because then it means that there's a fragility around that self-esteem because your body image today, I mean, even if we look at trends in, in what is even considered attractive, it could be totally different 10 years from now. And so where does that leave people? And if it's impairing or getting in the way of your life functioning, your social functioning, your relationships, your jobs, your careers, then it's a problem. You know, that's when you know, okay, wait a minute, if the whole goal is to be happy and this the pursuit of this is actually getting in the way of my marriage, is getting in the way of my friendships, then how is that fulfilling that goal of being happy? Something is off there. So absolutely. I, I mean, I want people to you know, celebrate their body image and to have a good relationship with it go to the gym, be healthy, eat well. But it's more around not crossing that line, which can get very dangerous. 
And so if you feel like you have crossed that line, it sounds like you should probably get professional help. It's probably not something you probably can do on your own. Correct. Absolutely. I, I highly recommend it. And, and, you know, especially, you know, for men who in general are less likely to seek therapy to know that there are people who really do understand it. A lot of the men that I work with will say, you know, I, I, they come to see me because they know I wrote Adonis Complex or they saw something and they thought, oh, okay, this, I'm clearly not the first person that this, you know, psychologist has seen with this. And there are many people who have experience with this. And so to absolutely seek treatment because it can be a very, very, tormenting disorder, eating disorders, body dysmorphic disorder. It can get quite, quite severe. So please just, yeah, I just urge people to seek help if it crosses that line. And if you're a parent of a boy, I mean, as you say, a lot of the people you see are, are young men, like boys and teenagers. I mean, something you can start doing, I guess, is having that conversation with them when they start bringing things up. Like, hey, dad, is, am I must more muscular than, than yesterday? doesn't mean he has body dysmorphic disorder, but it's a, it's a, it's a time where you can have that conversation about it, right? It's like, Hey, what's going on there? Why are you concerned about that or whatever? Absolutely. I mean, it's very normative. I mean, I remember being a teenager. It's very normative to be insecure and to be insecure about your body image, especially when you're going through puberty. I would not want to go through puberty again. And, and so, you know, I tell parents, don't be alarmed that when, you know, you hear someone even say, Oh, I hate my body. I hate the way this looks. Oh, I hate, you know, that's, that's normative, but you definitely want to engage in it because, you know, it, it, I wouldn't dismiss it as just normative either, you know, so I don't overestimate it, but don't underestimate it either. And just have conversations and notice, well, you know, he, if he's saying, oh, I hate the way I look, but he's not going out with his friends that night because his hair doesn't look right hmm, then that's more concerning, you know, versus he might say, oh, I don't like this acne, but he's still going out and he still has friends and having a good time. That's sort of more, you know, normative. So to definitely keep your eye out, especially for boys, because we're taught, you know, to be aware of how we talk about body and food with our daughters as we should be. But we don't think about our sons in in this. And I, you know, many parents that I work with, you know, will often feel very guilty. And I tell them, you know, not to, because as parents, we all do the best that we can do. And we don't know what we don't know all the time. And, but they'll say, you know, I never even, it never occurred to me to be aware of how I talk about my own body. And this is for moms or dads around my son, or it didn't even occur to me to say, you know, to my son, Hey, you're looking a little chubby there, that that would be, that that could really produce a problem, you know, whereas no one, you know, or hopefully people aren't talking to their daughters that way. So that's another part that, you know, we just want to get awareness out there is that, you know, especially nowadays where with social media and everything, it's, you're out there. I mean, think about it as a teenager like you could be at a party and a picture could be taken of you. And let's say you don't look your best. And now it's like all over social media. It's just, there's more of an exposure in general to these young people to have to put a certain pressure on them to look a certain way. Yeah. I think it's also, you can have that conversation that we've had with young girls about, okay, that picture of the model in the ad has probably been Photoshopped, et cetera. Like have that same conversation with your boys. Like, hey, that men's health cover model, you know, he's probably been fasting and cutting weight and yep. it's probably been Photoshopped. Some, so it's like not, it's not possible to look like that all the time. And I've even, I've, exactly. I've had that conversation with my son, he's eight. And he'll see some like really jack dude. And he's like, dad, cause I power lift. And he's like, dad, why don't you look like that guy? And like the guy of course is like super ripped I don't look like right. that. And I have to explain it. Well, just because your muscles are ripped doesn't mean you're necessarily strong, right? And healthy. Mm-hmm. And it's been, it's been good. He, and like, yeah, he's eight, but like he gets it. Like, I think sometimes mm-hmm. we underestimate uh, what our kids can understand. That's absolutely true. I 100% agree with that. And I have those same conversations with my, with my son around, you know, that and around, you know, also just with celebrities. I mean, the, this is their career, you know, that if, if the rock suddenly lost all of his muscle mass, his career would be, you know, he'd lose his career for the most part. I mean, his career is built upon, you know, that body. Now, could he act in movies, you know, without that body? I'm sure, but he certainly wouldn't be getting the roles he's getting now. So his, his livelihood is dependent upon that. So d- he has to go to the gym and he has to be super aware of his diet. And, 
that's his job, you know, in, in that way. And I'm not saying, I'm not even commenting on whether it's healthy or not, but just for people to understand it's, it's easier when your livelihood is kind of dependent, you know, on that, even though, and again, I'm not even saying that that's always a healthy thing, but when the average kind of ordinary individual looks at someone and says, Oh, like I want to look like that. It's like, well, but that person is, is spending hours upon hours to look that way. And that's even assuming that everything you're seeing is not photoshopped, you know, but they have a trainer that they work with four hours a day and they have a cook that's making, you know, but absolutely. I, I've had those same conversations even when my son was young and he, he could, they could absorb a lot more than we think they can. Yeah, explain it like they don't. Yeah, they looked like that at that moment. They probably didn't look like that the next day. Like, <laughs> exactly. you, you know, like you know, like Brad Pitt doesn't look like Brad Pitt in Fight Club in that one scene anymore. No, he's, exactly. He's a Fifty year old guy now. Well, Roberto, this has been a great conversation. Do you? Is there some place people can go to learn more about what you're doing, your work? So unfortunately, I don't have any social media and I don't have a website. And I, you know, usually just urge people, if you Google my name, you know, you'll see articles, you'll see YouTube videos of, of from different outfits and platforms of whether it's in this topic of eating disorders in men, or I also specialize in working with individuals with ADHD and learning disabilities. So you'll see, you know, my name associated in that field as well. Um, but yeah, if you, if you Google my name, you'll see YouTube videos or things like that, documentaries around um, this particular issue. Well, Roberto Olivardia, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Oh, absolutely. It's been a, a great pleasure for me as well. My guest today was Dr. Roberto Olivardia. He's the co-author of the book, The Adonis Complex. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can check out our show notes at aom.is slash Adonis Complex, where you can find links to resources, where you can delve deeper into this topic.